on behalf of my colleagues, Judges Grundell, Levine, Beach, Sheldon, Keller, Prescott, and Mellons, I am very happy to welcome you to the Appellate Court and to the Connecticut Bar Association's 2015 Law Day celebration. I am particularly pleased to welcome, I believe Justice Robinson is here, am I correct? Yes. <laughs> to uh, welcome Justice Robinson of the Supreme Court, Judge Susan B. Handy, Connecticut Bar Association Vice President Monty Frank, Deputy Secretary of State James Ballone, whose office under the leadership of Secretary of State Denise Merrill is so actively engaged in civics education for students and all. In addition, we welcome parents, students, and teachers who are here to participate in this ceremony. As you will hear about in more detail shortly, this year's Law Day theme is Magna Carta, symbol of freedom under the law. This is the fourth year that the appellate court has hosted the Connecticut Bar Association Law Day ceremony. This is a wonderful opportunity to bring members of the bench, bar, and public together to celebrate the rule of law in this country. We are grateful to the members of the Connecticut Bar Association Civics Education Committee, led by Catherine Calaby and Jonathan Wiener, for taking the time necessary to organize this important event. What is law? President Dwight D. Eisenhower created it in 1958 as a day to celebrate our remarkable legal system. Each year, a theme is chosen highlighting a particular aspect of the rule of law, rule of law, or of our legal process and its effect on our daily lives. It is a day that lawyers in particular should herald. I urge each of the lawyers here today to spend some time each year on this day, as I do, considering the obligations and privileges that make us proud to be lawyers. We welcome the students who are participating <coughs> in the trial this morning, and I commend you all for your interest in the role of government and your, participa your participation in civic activities. We up here, and I'm sure I speak for others in the audience, look, for, look forward to listening and learning more about the Magna Carta and its role in our system of justice. We're about to begin the program, and I want to invite you all to take photographs or video, but I'm going to ask that you be mindful that the students will want to give their full attention to the proceedings. It is now my privilege to introduce the Vice President of the Connecticut Bar Association, Monty Frank. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you to the appellate court, Justice Robinson, members of the CBA Civics Education Committee, and thank you to Ralph Monaco, past president of the Connecticut Bar Association, for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. The charter known as the Magna Carta was issued 800 years ago in 1215. The document, handwritten in Latin on a single piece of sheepskin parchment, has become a symbol of the rule of law. It has come to represent the simple principle that no one is above the law. However, Magna Carta was essentially a failed peace treaty between nobles, vast landowners, and their king. It was not a document by and among the people. Last month I traveled to Washington DC as one of Connecticut's delegates to the American Bar Association House of Delegates. We were there to talk to members of Congress about criminal justice reforms and additional funding for legal aid. We had the privilege of having dinner in the rotunda of the National Archives. The president of the ABA spoke to us about Magna Carta, but I couldn't help but look past him to the original documents behind him. The Constitution, 
the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. In the Constitution, it says, we, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. The Due Process Clause of the Constitution was partly based on common law and on Magna Carta, which had become a foundation of English liberty against arbitrary power wielded by a tyrant. And while Magna Carta protections and rights applied just to nobles, the Constitution talked about all people. But as we know, when we adopted the Constitution, it was essentially to protect white men. It did nothing to abolish slavery, and many argue it may have strengthened it. The three-fifths compromise counted African Americans for purposes of the Electoral College in order to convince Southern states to sign on. Women were not permitted to vote. And it was not until about 150 years ago when a great lawyer by the name of Abraham Lincoln stood on a battlefield in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and he declared that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. At that time, we passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. In 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified, guaranteeing women the right to vote. In the 60s, we passed the Voting Rights Act, and now the rights of the LGBT community are being advanced. And so while Magna Carta may have been the pebble that was thrown in the water to start the ripple, that process has continued for 800 years, and it's now up to us to make sure the freedoms and rights of all people are pursued and that the rule of law is advanced. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kathy Calaby, and I am a member of the CBA Civics Education Committee, who um, together has put this program together for you this morning. The, um, in 2011, President Obama stated in a speech to Parliament, centuries ago, when kings, emperors, and warlords reigned over much of the world, it was the English who first spelled out the rights and liberties of man and the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta, as we've been told, has become an international symbol of the law. It represents the principle that no one, no matter how powerful, is above the law. But it also has confirmed and strengthened the existing practice that those charged with government for crimes are entitled to a jury of their peers. Today, we will be illustrating this principle by conducting a mock trial in the case of the state versus Kim Dixon. A little background about the case. Kim Dixon is a 17-year-old high school student who's been charged with assault in the second degree, which is a felony punishable up to five years imprisonment. The state claims that Dixon intentionally tripped a fellow student, Chris Lyman, who fell down the school's stairs and broke her arm. The state, through its witnesses, intends to show that this act was a culmination of a long-running campaign of bullying by Kim Dixon against Chris Lyman. It's the state's position that the school officials ignored and covered up previous incidents of bullying, including cyberbullying, because of the different social positions of the parties. Kim comes from a family who is very prominent in the community, while Chris comes from a low-income family. As in any trial, the prosecution and defense version of events differs. The defense denies the bullying claim. Its position is that Chris fell down the stairs and, and it was an unfortunate accident. It was mere happenstance that Kim Dixon was in the vicinity where Chris fell. We now entrust this case to our presiding judge, Judge Susan Handy. Good morning. For purposes of today's 
exercise, we don't have time to do a full trial with witnesses questioned by lawyers and exhibits introduced. Instead, we're going to hear from six people who would have been called as witnesses in the trial. Their testimony and exhibits have previously been agreed to by the parties, and they will be the evidence that our jury will weigh as they decide whether the defendant, Kim Dixon, is guilty of assault in the second degree as charged. With that, I would like to introduce attorney Peter McShane, the state's attorney, who is going to be prosecuting for the state today. And I would ask attorney McShane, is the state ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. All right, please call your first witness. The state would like to call upon Chris Lyman, please. Ms. Lyman, please come forward and take the podium. Hello, my name is Chris Lyman. I'm a junior at Lakeville Eastern High School. I have been the object of cyberbullying for multiple years, physical bullying for the past few months, and on May 23rd, I broke my arm when I was tripped down the staircase. I'm worried that no one will believe my story. My family is really poor. My parents are divorced, and my mom has to work late nights at minimum wage. Because my mom works so, so late at night, I have to take care of my younger siblings, my two little brothers and sister. I make breakfast, check their homework, and take them to the bus before I head on to school. I take odd jobs during the summer to try and get a little money, but during the school year, I can't leave my siblings home alone. We are constantly behind on the rent, and the utilities sometimes go unpaid for months on end. My clothes are old and often dirty, because when the electricity and water is turned off, we just can't wash them. I sometimes go days without taking a shower, but during school, excuse me, I've had teachers have to pull me aside and told me that my smell was disturbing the other students. It's so embarrassing. During freshman year of high school, Kim Dixon started calling me cave lady. She said I smelt and looked like a Neanderthal. She scanned a picture from the textbook onto the computer and put my face on it. She then created a MyFace page under the name Chris Cave Lady Lyman. I understand good nature name calling and teasing. I have siblings, but this went so far beyond that. I asked Kim to take down the MyFace page, but she wouldn't. In fact, every time I asked, the harassment got worse. She started friending all of my classmates who would chime in on the bullying. They started a game where one person would post an insult about me, and the next one would try and one-up them. Kim would buy the winner lunch for a week. I admit, I tried to give it back to her. I created my face page for her, but I just couldn't keep up with her assaults. My attempts to fight back only increased her harassment. She started sending messages to my real my face page from the cave lady page, pretending to mock me. She mocked how I spoke and how I wrote. She said, told me she was impressed that I could walk without my hands dragging on the ground. <clears throat> this comment started moving things at the school. I was used to being tripped or pushed when I was walking down the hallway, but now people would grab my shoulders and try to push my hands to the ground. If I ever fell asleep in class, which happened sometimes from the late nights I had, they would take my hands and tie them to my shoes. So when the bell rang and I went to get up, my hands would be on the ground and I would fall. I filled out dozens of complaints. I brought the emails and the screenshots to the school. I told them about being pushed and having my hands tied. I told them about everything. I even told them who was responsible, but they did nothing. Kim Dixon, she's the school's darling. She's our top student. She's on our championship mock trial team. Her mom is a lawyer and her dad is, owns his own online, own online business. They're top donors to the school's PTA. Her mom is always here meeting with the principal, and her dad is frequently meets with the economics teacher and sometimes teaches. I don't know what the principal did with my complaints, but I do know that Kim was told about them because every time I made a new one, the next day she was on the MyFace page quoting them, but making my words look like a caveman said them. They gave her the complaints, had a good laugh about it, and then did nothing to stop it. On May 23rd, as I was going down the stairwell, central stairwell of my school, someone's leg shot out in front of me. I don't remember falling, but I remember landing on the ground and hearing the crack of my arm. I remember everyone laughing at me. 
Kim Dixon, she did this to me. And the school allowed it. I'm the victim. The law is supposed to protect those who can't protect themselves. My government teacher said, told our class, no one is above the law. But that's not, has not been my experience. Thank you. Attorney McShane. Yes, Your Honor. At this time, the state would call Officer Britt Green. Officer Green, please. Good morning. My name is Britt Green, and I'm, I've been the community police officer for the Eastern Lakeview High School for about six years. I have been trained and experienced in cyberbullying and I try to work with and be approachable to students throughout the school if they have any issues. Um, I'm at the Eastern Lakeview High School about two days a week, but oftentimes I'm there more. I'm available to meet with the students in my office, although that generally doesn't happen, and usually I just meet with them in the hallways and um, talk with them there. The school has a strict policy against bullying, which I helped to develop along with the students uh, faculty and other office officials. Everyone is aware of the policy as it is posted um, on the school's web page, locker rooms, and almost every bulletin board. And the teachers have been informed on how to deal with students who have experienced a bullying situation. Preventing or interfering with any student's attendance or performance at school, whether by threat, intimidation, or other means, is not tolerated under the policy. Bullying may also include verbal intimidation, harassment, violence of any kind, circulating mean-spirited rumors or gossip, or stealing another student's belongings. The school and I would take any allegation of bullying quite seriously and move and work very swiftly to ensure the safety of not only the bullied student, but the school body. I believe that students and the school should take an active role in teaching and encouraging understanding and tolerance for all students. Although the school offers assemblies, many of which I have spoken at, the school does not go far enough to address the bullying issue. The school policy should recognize and specifically address cyberbullying, however, it does not. I was at the school on May 23rd and was chatting with some students at the bottom of the school's central stairway. I noticed Chris Lyman standing on the middle staircase, and she seemed to be heading towards me. I wondered if she'd come, she would approach me to talk about one of the recent assemblies that I'd spoken at. The few times in the past that I'd talked to Chris, she seemed very withdrawn. Um, I then noticed that Kim Dixon and her friend Robin Dwight were standing near Chris on the middle landing. They were both laughing. The next thing I knew, Chris tumbled down the stairs and her face winced and she yelled out in pain. It was hard to tell if Kim had pushed her or if she had lost her balance when Kim moved towards her, but I do know that Chris would not have fallen if Kim Dixon had not been there. When the school nurse arrived, she confirmed that Chris's arm had been broken. Chris told me later that Kim Dixon had tripped her, and I met with the principal and relayed exactly what I saw in the situation. Uh, the principal told me that she would later follow up. Several weeks later, Chris told me that she was being cyberbullied by Kim Dixon. She showed me the screenshotted page from a MyFace account that she claimed was created by Kim Dixon. Uh, Chris said the principal was aware that this was going on, and I went to the principal with the screenshot and page and asked why action had not been taken against Kim Dixon. I was told that the school's policy did not cover cyberbullying that occurred off grounds, and in this situation, there was no proof that Kim Dixon was the original creator of the page or the sender of the screenshot or any other cyberbullying claims. Thank you. Attorney McShane, so I understand you have one additional witness. That's correct. If you're please, the state would like to call Dr. Terry Potter. Dr. Potter, please. Hello. My name is Dr. Terry Potter. I'm a practicing PhD psychologist. I hold a PhD in psychology from Washington University 
in St. Louis. I have 12 years experience with adolescent teens. I've always been infatuated in the effects of bullying. In fact, my master's thesis was the long-term effects of bullying, both on the victim and on the bully themselves. What I have found is that bullies routinely bully well into adulthood unless there's some sort of intervention. Early in 2014, I was contacted by Chris Lyman's mother, who indicated that she was concerned about Chris. Mrs. Lyman told me that she was an Iraq war veteran and had, traumatic, had seen traumatic stress cases and believed that Chris had similar symptoms. She told me, however, she was out of work for an extended period of time and needed to take a job at night for a minimum wage, which prevents her from spending evenings with her children. She said that she works a lot of overtime to pay the bills, which are often behind. I found time to meet with Mrs. Lineman on a weekend, and, she also, and I also met in private with Chris. With her mother present, Chris was hesitant to discuss the full extent of what was happening at school. However, after some weeks of regular sessions, Chris finally opened up and told me about the bullying that had been taking place since late in her grade school year. Chris showed me pages from a journal she had been keeping up for some time. Chris used writing as some form of release. The entries were quite revealing. Chris, was, Chris had an adult level comprehension of the effects of bullying, and I'm quite proud of Chris and how she has handled this. There are many who would have completely